check out our streaming schedule for this week. We've got tons of content in terms of the NFL and college football as we're going live just about every single day this week. So make sure you hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single moment where we go live. And now, on with our feature presentation. I want to give you a hypothetical example of something that might take you back to your days at school. So apologies in advance if school brings back traumatic memories or if you hate it and are still a student. However, I want you to imagine that you are taking a test and the test is a math test. On the test, one of the questions is to add the numbers five and six together. So naturally, you put down 11 since five plus six equals 11. However, your teacher marks the answer wrong saying that the answer wasn't 11, and instead was 16. Obviously, this is wrong, so you ask your teacher afterwards why your answer was marked wrong, and upon a further review, your teacher says that they made a mistake. Turns out, the teacher was wrong, and you were right, and the right answer was 11, not 16. Despite this, however, your teacher decides that they are not going to change the answer. Even though your teacher agrees that they messed up, and that you got the right answer and should have been given credit, and even though your teacher has a chance to change the grades, since the grades haven't even been put into the computer system yet, they refuse to do it for some inexplicable reason. You'd feel pretty ticked off, right? You'd be angry, and rightfully so, that you got the right answer, and your teacher is refusing to give you a better score as a result and give you what you deserve, especially when they have the power to do so. Something like that, would make you feel mad. However, something that wouldn't make me mad is if you hit that like button down below, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss a single video that we post on the channel. We post every single day on here about the weird and the wacky history of the NFL, so if you like that sort of stuff, then this is the place for you. So thanks in advance for your support as we try and hit 70,000 subscribers. Well, I bring that up because we have an absolutely insane controversy for you today that you probably never heard of but highlighted the absolute incompetence of the original Instant Replay system for the NFL. Today, Instant Replay is a vital part of the sport, and there aren't a whole lot of issues with it. But back in the late 80s when it was introduced, no one liked it. Instant Replay was absolutely terrible. It took way too long, and half the time, they got the call wrong anyways and screwed up. You can learn more about one of those disasters, where the referees got the call blatantly wrong after Instant Replay, because someone misspoke during a 1986 scheme between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Los Angeles Raiders by clicking the card in the upper right corner. It's actually kind of a miracle that Instant Replay lasted as long as it did during its first iteration, because it was on the chopping block every single year during the owners' meetings, and every single year, it seemed as though this would be the year that Instant Replay finally died, because it just wasn't working. And what we have today is another one of those problems that deserves a deep dive today, especially since the Minnesota Vikings and Los Angeles Rams played each other earlier this week if you're watching as of this video getting released. Because during week two of the 1987 NFL season, during this scheme that you've been watching this whole time, there was a highly controversial call in the Rams-Vikings scheme that went to instant replay and had the power to be overturned. And it wasn't, even though the replay official literally said that the call on the field was wrong. And this is the story behind one of the craziest instant replay controversies in the history of the NFL. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question and just how insane it was, we need some context to understand the importance of this game, as well as how the game itself was going up until this point. It's September 20th, 1987. It's week two of the NFL season, and we had to Anaheim for this NFC battle between the Los Angeles Rams and the Minnesota Vikings. No one quite knows what the future of the league holds after this, as the player is going to go on strike after this game, with the NFL and the NFLPA no closer to an agreement than they were before. So for the Rams, this game felt like a must-win, especially after losing in Week 1 to the Houston Oilers. No one knew how this season would be impacted by this, how short it was going to be, or how many games were going to be played by the replacement players, which would be a complete crapshoot. You needed to win this game and get back to 500 before the strike. Starting 0-2 back then was already bad, but starting 0-2 in 1987, with the future as uncertain as it was? That's really bad. And so far, this game was starting off, you guessed it, really badly for the Rams. 
This was the last thing that the Rams could afford to have happen. As near the end of the second quarter, they found themselves trailing 14-0. A first quarter touchdown pass from Wade Wilson to Carl Hilton gave the Vikings the early 7-0 lead. And they doubled their lead when Wilson threw his second touchdown pass of the game. With this one going to Anthony Carter. At this point, things were looking incredibly bleak for the Rams. It was going to be tough to come back from down two possessions, especially with the way the offense had been playing. However, if they got some good field position on something like, I don't know, a special teams miscue, then maybe, just maybe, the Rams could claw their way back into the contest, get some points before the half, and give themselves a chance at scoring some points. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. On third down, the Rams broke up a pass at the line of scrimmage, bringing up fourth down and setting the punting unit onto the field, led by punter Greg Coleman. What followed was nothing short of chaos. Coleman gets the snap and, sensing some pressure, takes a few steps before punting it, trying to juke one of the defenders out in order to have some space to punt this away. The good news for Coleman is that he's able to get this away. The bad news for Coleman is that the punt absolutely and utterly stinks, as what was a punt at their own 25-yard line only makes it to the 49-yard line, making this a 26-yard punt, giving the Rams the ball near midfield. However, the great news for Coleman is that none of that matters, because there is a flag on the play, as the Rams ran into the punter. That gives the Vikings a first down and keeps the Rams' defense on the field and negates Ellie's chances of getting good field position. A back-breaking penalty for the Rams at what seemed like the worst possible time. However, before we go any further, we need to break down two things. Number one, we need to look at how instant replay worked back in 1987. And number two, we need to look at what constituted running into the punter. Regarding instant replay, there were no challenges. You didn't get to throw the flag if you disagree with a call on the field. So it's not as though Rams head coach John Robinson could challenge this call, even if penalties could be reviewed, seeing as everything was initiated upstairs by the replay official. And yes, most penalties could not be challenged. However, just like today, certain penalties could be looked at from upstairs, provided that the penalty was an objective call. If a team had 12 men on the field, you could look at that. If a kickoff went 10 yards, you could look at that. If the ball was touched, you could absolutely look at that. Which takes us to the penalty on this play you've been watching this entire time. If you hit the punter after the punter releases the football, then this is a penalty. You can't do that, and you have to give the punter some protection. However, there are two exceptions to this rule. Number one, if the punter is running, then the punter is fair game. This is pretty subjective in terms of how many steps the punter is allowed to take before he is considered a runner, and whether juking out a defender in order to try and get some space after the blockers fail to do their jobs makes him a runner or not. But the other exception is if the punt gets blocked. If you get a hand on the football and make contact with the ball, and then you make contact with the punter, completely fair game. And seeing as this punt only went 26 yards, which was unlike Coleman, who had a few seasons in the mid-80s where he was near the top of the league in yards per punt, it's very likely that this kick got blocked. This is the frame where Coleman gets the ball off, and you see a Rams defender right there. Unless the ball went through his hands completely, that's a pump block. Is this the clearest quality, seeing as this is a recording of a game from 1987? Of course not, but you be the judge on that. And so, upstairs, replay official Armin Terzian reviewed the play. However, for the Rams, even though this play was getting a second look, it was all for nothing, as the call on the field stood. There was no block on the play, it was a penalty as a result, and the Vikings would get a first down and would stay on the field. This play was a massive one, as that flipped the game completely. Whereas the Rams could have had it near midfield with a chance to score before the half, they did get that chance, and they went into the half down 14-0 losing the game by five points at the end of the day. But after the game, Terzian spoke with a reporter about what he saw and why the call on the field stood. And folks, let's just say that this explanation made absolutely no sense. And if you think the referees are unqualified today, get a load of what life was like in 1987. 
because in explaining why the call on the field stood, Terzian said, I thought there might be a touching of the ball, which negates any roughing of the kicker. Wait a second, wait a second. Time out. So in your eyes, you thought that the ball was touched. You said that the ball was touched. And you said, point blank, that if the ball was touched, that it means that roughing the kicker doesn't apply. And yet, despite saying that, and despite reviewing the play for that specific purpose, you chose to leave the call on the field as it stood? It's one thing to say that the call was wrong, but there was no recourse to overturn it. It's another thing entirely to review the play, admit that the call was wrong, and do absolutely positively nothing about it when you have the power to do so. How does this make any sense at all? Seriously, how does this make any sense? It's like the It's Not My Wallet scene from Spongebob. You're allowed to review the play. You reviewed the play. You admitted that the call was wrong. And you had the power to overturn the call. And you chose not to because, uh, reasons? It doesn't make any sense to me. It's like if, in soccer, you have VAR to check whether the ball crossed the goal line. You review the play and see if the ball crossed the line fully, and yet, you say that there was no goal. How can you be this stupid or corrupt or whatever you want to call it? And if that name, Armin Terzian, sounds familiar, and you feel as though you've heard that name somewhere before, that's because he was involved in another huge replay controversy a year later during a Week 3 game in 1988 between the New York Giants and the Dallas Cowboys. And that one literally ended his career. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Terzian refused to review a play that was incorrectly ruled a safety. And it turns out to be a big play, seeing as the Giants won the game 12-10, as in, by two points, or the margin of the safety. He was about to be punished by Commissioner Pete Rozelle for his actions, but instead, Terzian just resigned. It was that bizarre. He was absolutely clueless. That Cowboys game exemplified that, and man, did this Vikings-Rams game exemplify that as well. Seeing as he refused to change the call on the field, even though he point blank said that the call on the field was wrong. As for what happened after the game between these two teams behind me right here, again, the Rams ended up losing this one by five points. I'm not saying that the blown call here by the replay official was the main reason they lost the game. Far from it. But it definitely didn't help their cause, I know that much. Now, this play has somewhat been forgotten throughout NFL history all these years later, because even just two days after this, the players went on strike, so it was really tough to think about anything NFL and any games on the field when there weren't any games taking place and when the league was, for all intents and purposes, out of business. However, the Rams could not recover from this loss whatsoever, as they started the season with an abysmal 1-7 record, and they ended up missing the postseason. That 0-2 start definitely did not help them whatsoever. Instantly play was really bizarre back in 1987, and fortunately for the NFL at least, there was never another controversial call in a Vikings-Rams game ever again. Never happened. I can promise you, that has never ever happened since- Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I think it's fair to say that nothing about this made any sense whatsoever. If the referee literally says that the call is wrong, and the referee has the power to change it, then the referee should, you know, change the call. What's the point of having instant replay if you're not going to use it? What's the point of having a Ferrari if you're just going to drive around the neighborhood at 10 miles per hour? What's the point of having a system like this where you can literally change the call on the field that you choose not to because either you don't know the rules whatsoever or because you're too arrogant and stubborn to do so? Whatever the case, in 1987, after further review, the ruling on the field is that this system and this official absolutely stunk. Be sure to like and subscribe if you have not done so already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And check out my other channels, JG8 for the history of college football, JG7 for the history of baseball, and JG9 News, where you talk about all things happening in the NFL. Join me every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, where we'll play live NFL trivia for cash prizes. And make sure to join me live as we're on stream just about every single day. And thanks to all our Patreon members and our YouTube members for helping out the channel. See how you become a member and show your support financially in the description down below.